Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton, and on today's episode, we've got uh, what has been referred to me as the Burning Man crew, and I'm excited to learn uh, more about what that is, as I'm sure you all are as well. So without further ado, Ken, why don't you introduce us to the crew? All right. Well, we've got four friends of mine uh, on the podcast today who in years past have spent a considerable amount of time out in the deserts of Nevada, um, not so much participating in, but participating in uh, the Burning Man uh, event. I don't even know what to call it. It's more of a happening. Uh, Burning Man is, uh, I'll let them tell you in their own words, but it's an, uh, it's a thing that happens out in the uh, near Garlock, uh, Nevada, and uh, it's held on a on a on a flat area. And I've had a couple of exposures to Burning Man. I've never attended the actual event, but one time I was out in Nevada hunting uh, for pronghorn antelope, and I was going to be up on the on the highlands above the area where Burning Man goes on, and I actually saw the Burning Man get ignited down below and wow. saw it. Know from up there. Anyway, as I was going out to uh, to the area, I stopped in town and got some gas, and I went into the local watering hole and was getting a hamburger. And there was a guy sitting next to me at the bar, and uh, we were talking a little bit. And I was trying to figure out if there was a way to turn it into an evangelistic conversation. And so I said, "Hey, what are all these cars I see going on?" or driving around out here to say, I'm going to Burning Man. And I'll just add that when I had stopped at the gas station, um, a woman had gotten out of a powder blue VW and she was topless. And she had written on the glass of the back of her VW bug, I'm on my way to Burning Man. I kind of knew what Burning Man was. I'd read about it and, you know, I knew it wasn't really my cup of tea, but Anyway, so I'm trying to draw this old grizzled guy who looked like he'd come in from the desert on a burrow. Maybe he was a you know gold miner who got lost from the 1800s. And uh, I said, so what is this Burning Man thing? I'm just, again, trying to make conversation, hoping it'll become evangelistic. And he looks at me and, and he says, I'll tell you what it is. And then he uses a word that I won't use because it's a four-letter word that begins with that. But he says, it's that pagan idolatry. And I I just started cracking up because why would anyone call it pagan idolatry and be using that particular expletive? Um, That's my my overlay to Burning Man. To me, this is the absolute cutting edge. It's the front lines of evangelism. I don't know if it's the hardest place to evangelize, or maybe in some ways it's easy because people are spiritually open. You'll hear about this from our Burning Man team. But it certainly gives you a picture of a, of a side of spirituality and of society that you won't commonly encounter. And so uh, as we launch into this, why don't the four of you introduce yourselves and let's start the conversation with how did you get involved in ministering at Burning Man? Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Katie. I'm Katie Mazza. <laughs> Rob Mazza. Andrea Berther. And Barb Owens. All right. Well, welcome to the show, all of you. Uh, I know these guys. They're friends of mine. They live up in Idaho now. And they, uh, I don't know, they have a great community that they belong to. It's a very prophetic community and still very committed to evangelism. Let's talk about how you guys got involved in uh, in the whole Burning Man world way back in the day. Yeah, way uh, way back in the day, Ken. (laughs) It was John Paul's fault, John Paul Jackson. Um, he uh, strongly suggested that Reese Saunders, who was the head of outreach for Streams Ministries, uh, form a team and go there. So uh, recently, uh, Reese reluctantly responded, gulp, yes, seven of us showed up. Uh and we thought we were pretty good because we were exploring back then in the early 2000s prophetic evangelism and what we could do with it. And a lot of it was John Paul's uh, push, you know, encouragement. So, uh, yeah, we went, seven of us, and we went at the invitation of joining a camp that was run by a man that worked with IHOP, Randy Barather. Oh, no. 
Andy Bolander. Bolander. <laughs> you're, that's your sorry. That's her husband. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I didn't know that side and, of Randy. And he would have nothing to do with Bernie. <laughs> Not in those days. Okay, wait a minute, Rob. Before you go any further, you got to define the term camp for our listeners. They will not understand that language. Okay. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were, uh, we acquiesced to John Paul's invitation to go. And you basically have to sign up for a camp. And you put in an application and a site plan for how much land you need to put up your tents and whatnot. And so we were given a X amount of whatever square feet. And it's specifically place wherever they choose, you know. So it's great. We we had a um geodesic dome for coffee and mild and mild level encounters. It was more like a chill space. Then we had what we call our encounter tent, which was a huge, probably desert storm military tent, maybe 90 feet long. And I don't know what, 12 feet, 14? Eight, 18 feet wide. 18 feet wide. <clears throat> so that that was the uh, that was the core stuff. And we'll talk about that later. But these guys came along, what, 2007? I was 2007. And I did 10 years. Yeah. yeah. And then Katie, you started. I started in 2011 and I did seven straight years. Yeah. And I was 2012 for six years. And by then the camp had grown to around about 35, give or take every year from literally all over the U.S., including Sweden, Scotland and, uh, and Canada, Canada, Canada. Yeah. And one thing I'll clarify with what Rob said, um, the camp, first of all, when you they had theme camps. That's what we were. We were a theme camp. So there's, I don't know how many theme camps they have. And then aside from the theme camps, there's just people who just show up to participate and they'll just show up with their campers or their tents or whatever. So they don't have a, a theme camp like what we had, but we were right. technically a theme camp. And yeah. something that's important to mention with that is when you have a theme camp, you are giving a gift. It's a gifting society. So you give a gift for free. Now, some of the theme camps that are out there are very innocent, like bacon without borders you can get free bacon <laughs> yeah. you know um some of the theme camps are very very dark and gross there's orgy camps and anything that you can imagine exists out there so our yeah. camp gave away you know spiritual encounters basically and free coffee drinks and coffee coffee yeah. drinks water mm -hmm. food you name it we were a giving camp all the way around and the other thing that separated us from a lot of camp is we were a day camp we didn't want what came out at night. And besides, after eight, six, eight hours of ministry, we were just done, done. Yeah. You know, so. so what is it that draws or, well, Burning Man, I think it kind of went through a big dip during COVID. But anyway, I think it's going on still. What is it that draws people or drew people to Burning Man? What, what were they seeking? What, you know, why would they be there? <laughs> For many people that I talk to, they would go to Burning Man to spend one week out of the year being, in their term, free, unencumbered by the responsibilities of their regular life. And in their choice of that word freedom, to them, it meant they could do anything that they wanted and it would be legal. And that they wouldn't be judged by anybody. Mm -hmm. It actually but there was some started. kind of a central planning function that determined how many square feet you could have for your camp. So even at that, there were some some kind of boundaries and controls, were there not? Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's Burning Man started. They had these ten core principles that is when it started back in I think the eighties, eighty five or something. It, yeah. That um, it's just this altruistic list of radical inclusion and radical self expression and all these things that on paper sound good, um, at, but really it just was that you know free for all freedom that leads to all the debauchery. But by the time we retired in twenty seventeen, even the true like old school burners were talking about the fact that it had degenerated into just a big orgy 
that um, even some of those more altruistic roots of Burning Man had gone by the wayside. And I, you know, young people that I know, family members that wanted to go, they just wanted to go for the party and, yeah. and for the, you know, do whatever you want kind yeah. of thing. It sounds all great. Or, or on another level, uh, it became very commercial. It was the thing, the place to show up. If you were in uh, probably in San Francisco uh, during those days of Burning Man, you were in the wrong place. So it became almost a commercial thing against their wishes. I remember the early days, you couldn't even have a logo on your tent or on your vehicle. It strongly encouraged the tape over logos that are going to be used for advertising. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes something else. There were exclusive camps where you could fly in. Everything was set up for you, your tent, your art car, uh, catered meals. Mm -hmm. So it kind of lost its purity, purity in a sense of right. <laughs> their vision. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. early on, we could work with the 10 mm -hmm. principles, actually, uh, Randy Bolander, you know, he wrote a brilliant article, Why God Loves Burning Man, and answered every principle according to the ways of God. Mm. So interesting. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever use that as any kind of a rubric for presenting the gospel? Or did you do your gospel presentations not so much as a sermon, but more as just personal interactions. How did you how did you work with those ten principles? I think the key word for us would be encounter. Okay. Um, you know, uh, in, in communication, I, I'm sure you know this that you know maybe ten percent of communication is words. And perhaps 30% is voice inflection, tonality. And then there's body language, that mysterious 60%. So we capitalize on a lot of these things. And, you know, we, we came to the realization, Holy Spirit is all about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one that, that set that sort of metric within the human being. So we would have basically... At the extreme end, I mean, they could come in just for water and casual chat, and then they can come into the coffee dome and just chill with music. And we would have people that would chat with them, you know, where you're from, what motivated you to come here, whatever, just casual conversation. But then the encounter tent we had, we had a spiritual menu board, kind of like a roadside cafe was the original idea. So you can choose... Uh, Help me out here. Uh, spiritual encounter, yeah. destiny, direction, dream interpretation, yeah. spiritual cleansing, encouraging words. Encouraging words. Yeah. And then uh, something we call a spirit. What did we call it originally? Spiritual experience. But I think after a while, we started making up different terms for it called like free fall. Would you like a free fall? And people love the free fall. Yeah. And that's basically where we. So basically, we'd sit them uh, with a lead, and these these guys were all leads, and I was sort of the guy that greeted them at the gate, along with my co-leader, sat them in the waiting room, chatted them up, and found out what they wanted, and then we'd ask Holy Spirit which one of ten groups we sh we were to seat them with. So they would have uh, a partner, maybe two partners, junior partners on our team. And uh, they would go off that kind of like springboard off that menu board. It would give them a point of conversation after we get to know them kind of thing. Lots of eye contact, as much touching as we could do. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would springboard after that. But after that, it was totally kind of Holy Spirit. We'd always end up invariably with a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. And then have them decide where they want to go with it yeah. but you know out there we we really have found this to be true that evangelism is not one size fits all mm -hmm. and so it was prophetic evangelism you never know what's going to happen so you're listening holy spirit what do you want to do with this person what does this person need today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he, I, we found that he's extremely creative mm -hmm. yeah and 
a lot of times we would just be flying with the Holy Spirit and we have no idea what's even happening until (laughs) uh, after the fact, we'd have to debrief and say, okay, what just happened? Because Mm -hmm. God just showed up and I don't even understand what happened. Yeah. Um, And we had to be that willing to trust the Holy Spirit and where it was going. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, the debriefs were a big part as, as much a part of it, which, which brings us into another vital point for me was Burning Man was as much about us changing our hearts and mindsets. I, I call it my university of the spirit. Yeah, for sure. I don't know anything like it. Yeah. You're well, pushed you've never to, the had to use all of the gifts of the spirit in one setting kind of continuously. Yeah. And without that, without that gifting, y- y- you knew it would fail. I mean, there, there was no, yeah. Oh, yeah. you couldn't fake this one, right? No, yeah. no. The other, uh, one of the other aspects about the uniqueness of our, what we did was how the team would be synced up. Mm-hmm. So for example, in the coffee dome, we had a woman there that did uh, body painting, you know, face painting or on your arm, your hand, whatever. And, and she would do that prophetically. And so time and time again, there would be people that would come for an encounter and have an encounter. And then they'd come into the coffee dome and chill. And they would sit down before her without telling her what had just happened in the encounter tent. And she would paint something that they would, that would just blow them away because that she, they would look at the painting and go, oh my gosh. And they would go, well, this just happened and this just happened and it's all here in your painting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And yeah. the other way around as well. Yeah. They, would get, they would have yeah. their painting first and she would, she'd get a picture from the Lord and then she would paint it and then she would prophesy over the painting. And then they'd come in and have an encounter mm-hmm. and the encounter would be exactly what she just prophesied. Only the people didn't even know it. So there was a, a yeah. great synergy that would happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So you guys, I, I, I know I've met, like, I can't remember his name now, but the one guy that I met when I was up in Idaho. Will. Yeah, Will. Right. Mm-hmm. So I know a bit about his story, but you had a lot of those kind of people. Mm-hmm. I, I've got multiple questions that I'm sure our listeners would be having in their minds. First of all, how did you not get sucked into this? You know, there's always this fear that if you hang around people that are too pagan, too worldly, you know, try and go into the bars to evangelize, you'll end up becoming a drunk yourself, that sort of mentality. Yeah. How did you resist the black hole attraction of, you know, all that was going on at Burning Man? Uh, that would be one uh, question I think our listeners might have. Yeah. But okay. another one would be once you got people saved, how did you get them out of the black hole? <laughs> Good, great questions. Uh, we're going to do terrible on the second one, <laughs> but not, but not terrible. And we'll, we'll explain it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the first one, there's, there was an incredible amount of prep on our end. We, we put in at least nine months of communication. Uh, we had, you had to be recommended by one of the team to come on to the team as a new member. Uh, or a pastoral recommendation, but we preferred uh, hands-on. Somebody, somebody had to know the person. You have to vouch for them, and then you're responsible, like a spiritual buddy system. You're responsible for them. Uh, I would. I wrote a riot act, what we called a riot act. It was like 10, 10 boundaries you need to know that are non-negotiable. You know, like get your act cleaned up, or mm-hmm. or. Uh, your marriage yeah your marriage is your spouse on board with that does she know the ramifications of you're going to be looking at naked people Mm -hmm. how good are you at eye contact (laughs) you know (laughs) and only eye contact yeah Yeah. exactly yeah Yeah. and we got we we, remind me we'll have to tell a story about what happens when naked people come in because people ask that wonder about that stuff Mm -hmm. right so we, we had all this prep work. Yeah. yeah. And we, the, the, by the time I came onto the team in 2012, they had gotten that system down pretty well. So 
I, Andrea was my official sponsor, but really I had, you know, the others also. And so any, in any way that I was nervous, I felt covered because they were looking out for me. And that's the way it was supposed to look. If you mm -hmm. sponsored someone onto the team, it was your responsibility to check in with them. How are they doing? And you really needed to know that they could handle going out to an environment like that before you took them out there. Yeah. Yeah. It was your job to know that. Yeah. You have to know the person so that you can vouch for their mm -hmm. character. Mm -hmm that they don't have a whole lot of uh, ugly wounds hanging out that can be right. exploited yeah. in a place like that. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, we will say we did have some casualties. Mm -hmm. There were some mm -hmm. people that came yeah. out on the team that things yeah. did not go well for them. Yeah. Because now, they was that the because they like mentally and spiritually just sort of imploded or was it because they wandered away from the camp and got into all of the things that were going on? At no, Bernie? it was personal. It was, okay personal yeah. issues that blew up yeah basically it, if, if you have big cracks there it yeah. will <clears throat> it will show i mean we, yeah. you can cover so much as a team right. and and we can preach so much you know like a crack in our unity would mess us up seriously mm -hmm. or envy or competition or, or gossip or yeah. gossip all the things that exist in a church <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can't no yeah and i would say as a leader no you can't do what you do in church here you really can't <laughs> yeah you can't even you can't even have this entertain thoughts like that yeah because there's high level witchcraft going on yeah and, and they know how you know, to target you yeah how to target there was one year where i love telling the story so andrea um we had an offsite head inter intercessor. This is another way that we covered ourselves is every person was responsible for having their own personal intercession team. So people back home who were praying for them. And then we had one person back home who was the offsite head intercessor, whose job was to communicate with all the other intercessors, any information coming off the playa. And then on the team, so out there at Burning Man, um, they eventually developed the on-site head intercessor, who was Andrea. That's because God volunteered me for that job. He won't told you. Really he won't told you. He yeah. volunteered me. Yeah. yeah. But these were just layers of protection that we had in place to make sure that we kept our, ourselves and our teammates covered and protected. And there was one year we were out there. And so Andrea, being the on-site head intercessor, I mean, she's already spiritually sensitive, but it was like really ramped up out there. Mm -hmm. And one year she calls us all into the coffee dome at, at night. And we're like, we know we're in trouble because Andrea's <laughs> like <laughs> calling us to task. And so we all shuffle in there. <laughs> she basically says, uh, there are open doors in your lives. You guys are, there's some people here carrying some sin and I'm tired of feeling it. So you need to go find someone to confess your sin to and take care of it because I'm done with this. Wow. <laughs> I mean, tail between our legs. We all went out. And um, I mean, I know I had stuff I had to go deal with. I'm sure most of us had some little things that we had like, oh, I guess I should have dealt with that before I got here. So, yeah. yeah. So God made sure, you know, but we did have all these protocols yeah. in place to yeah. cover it. And you, as far you know, as going uh, oh, out in the uh, because we are a day camp, we had our evenings free. Uh, but there are also, you know, some boundaries that were set in place by the leadership that, you know, if you're going to go out and venture out onto the playa at night, you're not going to go by yourself. Right. You're going right. to go in pairs of two or more. And um, that worked pretty well. It got to where I didn't even really want to go out because. Initially, the art really fascinated me because you, you, they do some amazing art installations out there. But as the years wore on, uh, there wasn't it kind of declined in my view. There would be a few, uh, maybe one or two pieces that were really worth going out and seeing. But it seemed to me it was it did not draw me. It was like, and nah, I just rather stay in camp. I like the atmosphere of camp. Mm -hmm. And the burners did too. We yeah. got yeah. comments over and over and over again because there was so much light and so much peace in our camp. They could feel it when they came yeah. across our border. Yeah. And that's one yeah. of the things that was so powerful in ministering the gospel to them is they could feel the presence mm -hmm. of God there. Yeah. 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 They, we have stories on how people, some woman was going, saying to herself, I just need a cup of coffee. I just need a cup mm -hmm. of coffee and wandered out. And you might have to help me with the story. A cup of coffee and a good conversation. And a good yeah. conversation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And 
lo and behold, <laughs> did someone direct her? No, she knows. Or she, she, she found a voice. A, yeah. She heard a she voice. Was walking down the street, had just passed our camp, and she heard a voice say something like, like free coffee or something like that. No, or what you're looking for is right in there, yes. or free coffee yeah. or something like something that. Like that yeah. She turned around and came into our camp. And there was the coffee and there was the co good conversation. Yeah. And it was very, very powerful for her. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah. So That's, the Holy Spirit would cooperate with. I, I was thinking of, a, I always mix that story up with another one that, that they were walking along and they said something like, where's this spirit dream? And they said, mm -hmm. well, you go over here down this street and then look for the camp with the rainbow over the halo or the halo. Look for the camp with the halo. <laughs> with the light over it. And wow. Which which brings up, you know, in addition to what Katie said about what draws people there, uh, at their core, we decided it's spiritual hunger. Mm -hmm. Not not all of them, and not all of them are geared toward the kind of spiritual hunger we would recognize as um, holy and right and whatever. Yeah. But genuine, deep spiritual searching. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll tell a little story. Uh, that I had in the beginning. The first two years were pretty difficult. We were just trying to find our feet. And I had a woman in my encounter just talking with her. And I I think I gave her a word of knowledge, you know, something positive, encouraging, whatever. And she, she kind of just suddenly pauses and she looks at me. And, you know, I wasn't fessing up that I was a Christian. We don't do that we allow them to label us but she says you know she goes that's all well and good she goes it is really good actually but i have a problem with you christians you think all you've got to do is speak a scripture at us and it's supposed to do something and i don't know she she was venting a bit against the church and all of a sudden, I had this moment with the Lord where I felt like I was supposed to say this. So it came out this way. I said, I said, suppose her name is Shirley. I said, Shirley, uh, I want to apologize on behalf of the church for judging you in your difference and missing your hunger. Because mm -hmm. God never misses your hunger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, I pulled that one out of the hat a few times mm -hmm. when when things were tough, when when there was anger present. Yeah. And uh, and learning yeah. to see, and learning to spot that hunger. It was one of the things that was one of the strongest lessons for me was I remember one encounter um, you or Darren brought back this guy and he had on all sort of <clears throat> amulets and um, he was into it deep into shamanism and all kinds of stuff. And um, I was with uh, Hannah in the um, encounter and we're getting into this encounter. And I had this remarkable like realization that the guy felt clean, like something spiritually felt clean in him. And I remember talking about it afterwards. It's like, it's amazing how people can be drinking from really dirty troughs, but when the hunger is genuine, they still, there's like still like a spiritual purity to them because they're honestly searching for truth. They just have been searching in the wrong places. And people like that, especially, they would come into our camp and boy, they recognized the difference between what we had and everything else that they'd encountered. And we learned so much from them. It's like sometimes, you know, growing up in this somewhat of a church environment, you kind of almost take for granted the light and the, mm -hmm. and the purity and the holiness and what that means. And then you see it through the eyes and the experience of someone who's been wallowing in darkness, trying to find that light. And it, it shakes you to the core. I mean, it really changes the way you understand purity and holiness and everything else. Mm -hmm. There, I, As someone that kind of kept the gate and welcomed people into the encounter tent, there were, there were these things that were happening almost every year and they would happen in threes, go figure. But I remember one year, people came in and they were going, wow, this is a really holy place. Mm -hmm. And then they would come along and say, this is really pure. How do you do it? Huh. Or I think the third one was, this is incredibly clean, yeah. but you know, what's your secret? So and did you guys 
have, I don't know, you know, 21 days of fasting before you would go up to the playa. So you would be clean or is this just that the differential between the light in you and the darkness that was around you was so distinct that they could sense it even without the 21 day fast? I think the more ladder, of the latter. The latter. But but we were all responsible for, I, I called it battening down the hatches. When I joined the team, God was really clear with me that there were certain things that had been fine for me, pretty burning man team. And it was nothing overtly horrible, but it was a matter of tightening up the boundaries of my own personal mm -hmm. walk. Mm -hmm. Books that used to be okay for me to read. And again, nothing, you know, pornographic or anything like that. This is not okay anymore. It's like it, just a personal tightening mm -hmm. up of the boundaries. So, mm -hmm. and we all had, we were all responsible for that for ourselves of what does that look like for you to prepare yourself to come out there mm -hmm. to the playa. So there may have been some people who yeah. were doing <clears throat> personal fasts or whatever, but um, and again, that would be something that'd probably be worked out like with your sponsor. What do you need to, you know, get out right. there so that you're ready to withstand the pressures out there? Right. So, so Rob started... you know, this is so interesting what you're saying, though, because the scripture even says, you know, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with him. And, you know, we we quote this pretty glibly. But you're telling us that people were seeing a halo over your tent. People are hearing voices speaking to them, go this way. I mean, we hear these things in the Bible, um, but most of us don't live in that world on a day-to-day -day basis. And then people are coming into your, into your tent. They're, if you will, crossing a spiritual boundary because mm -hmm. they're now on your territory that's been reserved for you by the leaders of this thing. And when they get in there, they're saying things like, you're pure, you're holy, you're clean. Um, and you're just you being you. I mean, you're there to serve the Lord. You're on a mission. That's fair. But but the point is, this is actually discernible. We're not just talking about fluff here. We're not just talking about some ethereal thing. There's actual tangibility to it that people are encountering in your tent or in your zone they're having God guide them to you in order that they would have whatever evangelistic or other conversation, maybe it's healing or something. But I mean, this is the stuff like right out of the Bible. And I think for a lot of our listeners, they're, they're not accustomed to operating in that kind of a space. When you guys came home from Burning Man, did you feel like, I don't know, you were you needed to kind of reset everything. So you went back to me. Yeah, it's, it's called a decompression. Yeah. It's actually a thing called decompression. So okay. a lot of people come back and they're actually, they're actually pretty ruined. Mm -hmm. Like they've seen what God does in a place like that. And then they come back to normal life mm -hmm. normal and they don't church. want to go back to normal church and normal life because right. they see yeah. extraordinary things. Yeah. yeah. So it does change you. Yeah. And you, you look at the world differently. Yeah. 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 But I, I just want to touch on that light thing. Um, we spent we spend quite a bit of time talking about the light within us. You know, Christ in us, the hope of glory, the light, the presence of God within us, uh, the abundance of God within us. And just just I mean, that's it's almost impossible to wrap your mind around it. But your spirit knows. And yeah. so sort of like as your dumb boy soul just sort of nods its head and goes, yes, I am the light of the world. And that light <laughs> is going far beyond my boundaries, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and and kudos to John Paul. Uh, we would make everyone take the Art of Hearing God course right. that um, I happen to teach. Uh, but every that was part of the requirement, the Art of Hearing God for all these basics of understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> when, when right, so, uh, so that was your boot camp, the art of hearing God. Uh, people kind of clean up their lives in whatever way they realize they need to do. What other kinds of prep did you do? Did you give people training in like a basic evangelism approach or did, was it all just one-to-one -one conversations, very ad hoc as things unfolded? Well, there was a combination of things. I one I think in addition to the art of hearing God, which is a requirement, we also really wanted all of them to take understanding dreams and visions. And in the course of all of that, uh, Rob especially would, well, he taught all of us about 
uh, non speaking non religious language mm -hmm. and thinking about what you want to say and instead of blurting it out think about the words that you're going to use that are non religious and that was also kind of a requirement so people had to to really it wasn't like you can when you're used to if all you do is speak christianese in your circle then unless you're practicing that you're going to do it out there on the playa and and so they would we wouldn't allow that so uh that was just one aspect and why I, I would think... we allow it katie <laughs> because we were not we were approaching them in a way that they could receive us and not being blatantly oh uh having jesus on written on our camp literally we would uh, they would they were more open to receiving they had um an aversion to the name jesus sometimes and also definitely the word christianity yeah because they have a false understanding of what yeah. it looked like yeah, so exactly. when, you, when you talk about evangelistic i mean this is not like you know going out with the four spiritual laws and walking them through the roman right. road Right. This is a completely different way. You know, how many touches, I don't know what the statistics are now, but how many touches does it take before somebody comes to Christ? I know it used to be seven back when I got saved. I don't even know how many it is now. And we had to um, resign ourselves, for lack of better language, to the fact that we were probably going to be one of those initial touches for most of the people we met. Well, with those initial touches, what you're doing is a tip, you're tipping and tipping and tipping them toward truth. And so, yes, sometimes we did get to go all the way and actually lead people to Christ, like this will that uh, the other podcast you talked about. We definitely had those encounters where we got to so-called seal the deal. But more often than not, we were um, a touch point for them in their journey and getting to the point where to grasp the beauty of just loving them with the love of God and letting them have an encounter with the true Jesus. Because like Katie said, you know, they have all this baggage with the name of Jesus and the, the term Christianity, right. stuff that is that's come from whatever. Um, and so rather than going in there saying, I'm a Christian, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. We show them what Jesus looked like, mm -hmm. felt like, acted like. Mm -hmm. And so it, that and then sometimes we did get to actually tell them. And we need to tell you, this is, you know, Jesus that we've been, you know, encountering here. Other times we felt the restraint of just let them, let this marinate, let this touch marinate with them. And, you know, God is big enough. If God can bring them to our camp at Burning Man, he's big enough yeah. to take the deposit we've made when they get back home and, and another believer to encounter them or whatever that looks like. And we learn to trust God with the whole picture mm -hmm. and just do our part. For so us, I think that's a really important learning for anybody who's doing evangelism anywhere. On the one hand, we don't just want to soft pedal things. I think sometimes people want to do that because right. they're, they're a little ashamed or they're a little afraid or they don't know what to say. But at the same time, we don't have to close the deal every single time. Sure. We just got to move the ball down the field, however, however we can do that. And yeah. sometimes that's not even obvious. So I, I I can completely understand this thing of, okay, we, we didn't close every person we talked with, but we did have meaningful exchanges with them that reframed their way of thinking. And if we can yeah. help yeah. people think about Jesus, God, spirituality, Christianity in a different light, that in itself is making progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, and I, the only thing I would add to Barb's thing is I think they got more than one God touch when they came to us. Because what they saw was a team welded of 30, 35 people pretty much on the same page. You know, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have this fellowship of light right. between one another. And they're all looking at it like they would sit with an encounter group of three people and go, you guys are in synergy. How do you do that? <laughs> And I'm thinking back of new age fairs I did. I would notice that kind of language would spring up more often. In fact, I used to do an exit poll at new age fairs. Um, how was the encounter on a scale of one to 10? And they'd go, oh, like seven, nine, eight, whatever. Usually high numbers. But then my second question I was really interested in, how was the synergy between the people you talked to? And they would go 10. Can I say 12? Wow. It was unbelievable. And that's what 
I believe, really set us apart from people that don't walk in the light. Yeah, that really that, that that's an interesting perspective to get an outsider's view um, of a team that's working. We all know what it looks like when it doesn't. Um, but when we talk about the importance of unity and love one another, that people actually can see that and perceive it, mm -hmm. even though we're all imperfect people who are broken vessels. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it actually became an attractional point where people said, yeah, there's something here that's really substantive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And another thing I heard people ask over and over again is they could see that we would pour out and minister to people for six to seven hours a day. And they're, they were asking us, how do you do that? How do you pour out of yourself? And how do you not run dry? And so we were able to talk about our source, mm -hmm. that never ending source of life mm -hmm. that we operate in and our connection point. Yeah. Another thing that they would see and take notice of was the joy and how much we actually enjoyed yeah. one another mm -hmm. and how much we laughed mm -hmm. and how much we just, I mean, it was the kind of, kind of just this joyful laughter that is attractive mm -hmm. that catches your attention. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had two, two women camping on our, on our land. We didn't usually let people camp on our land, but it would get so crowded, 80,000 people, people would be, looking for real estate. So I allowed two women, I just said, listen, we're a day camp. Here's the rules. No drinking, no partying. You can sleep here. So so I checked in on them in three days. And the first thing they said is, we wake up to your laughter every morning. Who laughs early in the morning? Who are you people? <laughs> that's, <laughs> so. a, that's actually really amazing. And I think it it gives all of us something to think about in terms of what is our witness anyway. It's it's a lot more than our words. It's yes. Yes. carry ourselves. It's our body language. It's yes. it's our laughter. Yeah. yeah, the king the kingdom of heaven is you know it's not just righteousness. It's, it's peace, it's joy, peace and, and joy. Yeah, and that's something we're exploring a lot lately. How far can this joy in the Holy Spirit, you know, in a, in a sense, exploring? cultivating that even more mm -hmm. We're, we've been playing with that a lot lately yeah so let's take that um we we need to land this in a few minutes here mm -hmm. uh but let's take that as a kind of an interesting jumping off point for maybe some closing thoughts how do you how do you come home from burning man you guys said you disbanded in 2017 of course we had three years just us. Us. Just, the four just us yeah yeah you guys yeah the team kept going for a couple right. of years yeah yeah <laughs> but you four, um, and then we get COVID comes in kind of the end of 2019, early 2020, and then they aren't really doing it. I think they did it virtually or something, but I, th I think Burning Man virtually would not be the same at all. <laughs> uh, and now I guess things may come back to something more like what we think of as Burning Man. Yeah. But how do you take these learnings about witness and sharing and the encounters people are having? How do you plug these back into a suburban bedroom community yeah. in, yeah. in your case, Idaho, but it could be Nashville, Tennessee or Los Angeles. How do we do, how do we take that series of learnings and make so, it practical for where we live today? So we are more effective as evangelists. Yeah. So our team, we have taken it into the local community. So for over 12 years, like 12 and a half years, we've mm -hmm. done dream interpretation in a local coffee shop. So we take everything that we did at Burning Man, we just take it to a coffee shop. We've had a lot of experiences there. Mm -hmm. This year, um, we decided to take it out to the park. Um, we got a red couch and chairs and a, and a rug and a fake dog and <laughs> a lamp. And, and it was called the burning couch living room. And we had, we would set up in the city park and with a little, you know, a sandwich board that said, welcome to our living room where words are encouraging and hope is free. And, and people would just come in off the street and talk with us. And then um, we also added another element, something that we actually learned in Scotland, you know, the, the sound portraits. So mm -hmm. basically we have a team of musicians and they're taking you know, prophetic words, basically, and putting it into music. So we have somebody take a seat of honor and the musicians will 
listen to the Holy Spirit and begin to play music, whatever the Holy Spirit downslo- downloads over the person. And the, the music itself is a prophetic word to them and a, and a ministering to them. And then after they play for about five to seven minutes, then they would say what it was they thought they were getting and prophesy to the people. And that's a very, very creative and powerful ministry for people because music touches people deeply. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. We, we were fortunate too. And we always knew it in our time at Burning Man that we had this community that we were coming home to. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had teammates who did not have anything like what we had and it was harder for them. And so I think one of the biggest struggles for, is finding like-minded people. Yeah. Um, the art of hearing God glass, starting with that, if you can find, uh, I mean, you can take that online. You know, if people out there are hungry to get something going, they can get a group of people and do the online class together if there's no local teacher. Um, and, you know, uh, we had a pastor too who was open to it. So we've been able to really bring our dog and pony show right into the church and um, <laughs> for better or for worse, depending on who you are. <laughs> right. Um, but there are places to start. And Rob, you always said um, if you could get seven people who would commit to a vision, you could make it work. And we started the dream interpretation ministry here in Coeur d'Alene. You guys had done it prior, yeah. but with seven people. Right. And here we are now, 12 years later, and we're four of the original seven, three have moved on to other things, but the team has been just kind of grown and morphed and yeah. changed over the years. And, and we also learned the, um, what do we call it? The art of occupation, the art of showing up, showing up again and again and again. And Rob would talk to us about this in the early months when we were doing the coffee shop ministry, when we didn't have any customers. And he would say, you just keep showing up. We're, we're sowing into this ministry, sowing into this place and uh, the people will come. And we've had incredible Mm-hmm. encounters there yes yeah. but it started small yeah. and that's but, one oh, okay ahead. okay uh, just a little niche thing too is protocol and i'm not going to go into the history that uh, actually was native americans that gathered us up and said you want to learn the art of pro- protocol and we said yes and we're glad we did but bringing it to everyday use mm-hmm. we partner with anybody that will have us in there you know we 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 get we assure them that We don't want to interfere with the flow of business. Everything we do, we want to do with your approval. Right. So we want to be a blessing. We want to see your receipts increase on Thursday night when we're there. And we will do everything to honor uh, the mandate of your business, you know. So that's kind of core to us is honor uh, whoever, you know. I think there's a broad assumption within Christian communities because I'm saved, born again, highly favored, whatever, <laughs> we can say whatever, do whatever, and walk in with jack boots anywhere without doing proper protocol. Right. Just simply getting to know someone, getting to know their name and what their interests are. Mm-hmm. Um, small talk is valuable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a really good point. You, one other thing, you, you said it without saying it, I just want to point it out, is the intentionality um, you know, you're there every week at the coffee shop or every year when you were doing Burning Man, you know, you had to take a week off of whatever your regular schedule was, work, family, life, whatever it was, and go out there and live in the desert and do this. Um, you know, evangelism is something that can happen in the day to day, but usually things we plan to do go better than things that are just sort of off the seat of our pants. Uh, because things that we don't plan to do sometimes don't happen at all. Um, so I, I, I really applaud all of you for your attentionality and commitment to an evangelistic lifestyle. Um, you know, you're like soldiers who came home from the war and you're continuing to use all the best skills you learned, uh, in your own, in your own world now. Um, we need to we need to wrap up just because uh, we have other things to do today. Um, I love this conversation, and I wonder if one of you'd be willing to pray for our listeners that they could become engaged, even at this kind of extreme level, uh, with evangelism. Because the Lord knows our world needs more people to be coming to faith. We need to turn our cities and our nations back to God. Go ahead, Rob. Should we rock, paper, scissors for us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, Rob. <laughs> well, Father, we know that every every good idea comes down from you, the Father of lights. And that word was sent 
said intentionally we help us to embrace that we really really are the light of the world and it as your spirit goes out to touch people and just that alone will cause heads to turn so father i know that there's hearts out there that are just thinking like well this could be me and all it takes is a yes to that mm -hmm. jesus that love that's inside of you yeah. that um god that's constantly filling you up and wanting an outlet and so i just we just collectively speak blessing over every ear here to uh realize that love is exportable and it's powerful so uh bless them all in jesus name yeah. amen. amen amen thank you all four of you for taking time out of your day to be with us today and to record with us and um wow i just i love the stories i whenever i'm with you and you guys start talking burning man stories i just think i wish i'd gone and done that with you back when you were doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you need to come back for another visit <laughs> yeah. well I, I am coming back um i already have a date on the calendar i can't remember quite i think it's later in the year oh, good yeah i am i am coming back don't worry i'm like a plug nickel i keep coming back <laughs> Anyway, Grant, do you have anything you want to add? No, this was so inspiring. And thank you all for, for taking time uh, to be here and to be with us. And thank you all for tuning in and for listening. And uh, we'll be right back this time next week with another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. Hey, everyone. It's Julie with Orbis Ministries. As we reach the end of the year, we realize that some of you are in the habit of giving charitable donations. If the Lord prompts you to give elsewhere, we just want to bless you in that. But if he prompts you to give our direction, you can do so by clicking on the link in the description of this podcast. Thank you to everyone who would consider donating. We cannot do this work of ministry without your prayers and financial support. 